Thank you. I think we had a, a really good day yesterday. We'll have a, a wrap up of the whole day a little bit uh, later. But we're kind of switching course today. So yesterday we were really looking at uh, the clinical side of, of, pay, of case management. We were looking at what data we have. We were looking at how can we improve uh, both clinical care, the treatment side, but even the diagnostic side in a very simple diagnostic, well, not so simple in the end, what we thought was a very simple diagnostic, but we realized we're not quite as clear as we thought. And today we're making a real shift and we're looking much more at the side of access. If you remember from uh, Despo's uh, presentation of the, the cholera scoping mortality review from yesterday, I I remember being really shocked about a lot of things when I first when I you know I read the early drafts. One obviously was about the quality of data and that we really discussed yesterday, but the other was about the percentage of deaths that were recorded in the community, and I think what we saw that some of the some of the the contexts were reporting more than 50% of deaths occurring in the community and i think what i was even more shocked about is that i know that a lot of community deaths are not recorded so what else is happening out there um, it's something that, in fact, for uh, many of you pr will know that the, the weekly epidemiological review every year, there's a, um, there's a publication on the data that is reported to WHO the previous year. And it's actually something we've started to ask. And I do want to say that there were countries, including, thank you, Nigeria, who answered that question honestly. And I think it's something we need to look at more. I have as we go through this, I will, uh, there are always anecdotes, but um, I think it's also something that we have often, as case management, seen that access to com in the community is not the responsibility of, case manage of the case management pillar, and it is. And I think we need to be very clear about that, and I think we need to give it as much attention as every other piece of the network. And this sh very short presentation, which is based on a, um, well, it's just taken straight from it, let's be clear, from an existing document, really shows that how we, at, at the time that we published this in 2017, what we were looking at. And I think, you know, we talked about it yesterday of cholera deaths are preventable. We were looking at, you know, some of the things that will be life-saving once a person gets to treatment but that was all if they get to treatment. It is also our responsibility as case management to make sure they have access to treatment. And I think it, you know, we will probably mention this again because I was in a situation this year, and I'm not gonna name names, where somebody asked about ORPs and the case management pillar lead at that time said that's not case management's responsibility. Now, there were a lot of heads turned and 10 minutes later, it was, I guess it is, case management's responsibility. But that shouldn't even be a question. We have those two aspects, and it's, you know, these are the two, they, they came out very strongly in that scoping review. Again, not what we expected from that review, but it's a really useful review that clearly points out those two aspects. There's the clinical aspect, we don't have the data to identify who's at risk, how we can improve clinical care, but we're also not uh, providing access to treatment for patients. And interpreters, please slow me down if you need to. Bang on the window. Um, so this is, is, yeah, this is a, a quote from a, pu a published paper actually to de and, but it's in the, in this, in the uh, scoping, uh, the, um, in the, the, the note that I'm gonna be on the organization of care. To decrease mortality, one of the main challenges to ensure that individuals with cholera have access to treatment as soon as possible after symptoms appear. And essentially, our day-to-day -day is about that. It's how do we improve access to care. So we have this, I don't know how many of you know it, but there is a, an, a DTFCC case management working group technical note on the organization of case management during an outbreak. As you see, it's one of the earlier ones that was published. It was published in 2017. And when I went back and looked through it, I, there's, a lot of, it, there's a lot in there. There are things that I think we might change now, but there's a lot 
of really critical information in it. And I think one of the key elements is that we look at treatment as a network. You're not looking at a structure, but from the beginning, the, the, the framing of treatment is about a network of structures. And how do you ensure that patients access that network and, in the, and are then treated in the right place within that network? And I think we frequently see, we set up a CTC, and then the ORPs are set up. And it's done sequentially rather than, as we said, if you frame it as a network, then you build the network. And you can extend it, and you can do other things, and you can modify it as you need be. But you're not saying, we're building a CTC, and afterwards we will deal with, with access in the community, in whatever form that is. And I will say, many of you know, I worked for MSF for a long time. And I will put my hand up that, interestingly, the first cholera network outbreak I responded to, we did that. The ORPs were up. We looked at data. We shifted them. We had CTUs. We had CT oh, CTC. We had the whole thing. I never saw one as good again. I think I've been like working for 20 years to go back and find that, to find that, that again, that idea. But ever after that, it was we focused on the CT, on the CT, on the cholera treatment centers, on the hospital care, and we kind of thought, may, I don't think we thought very much about it, but it was sort of somebody else will do that. But if you don't work together and build that network and have people responsible for the different pieces, who is doing that? And I think that's that's sort of what today is is a, a, about, a lot about. So. Interestingly, I, I reread this whole document. It's a good exercise. And we mentioned everything from home treatment to community health workers, oral rehydration points, stabilization centers, and cholera treatment centers, either units or centers, which are actually should have done that, using both existing and new structures and adapting to the context. And I think the other thing that we're probably very weak, and I, this is us as a case management community rather than anybody is about the transport that we just we put up even when we do have multiple structures and we have some kind of network with oral rehydration points it's a really big challenge how do you get the patient you start them on ORS how do you get them to the treatment structure the next level structure so if somebody has severe dehydration or there's whatever the criteria in that country is and they're moving they need to move to a cholera treatment unit or a cholera treatment center how do we get them there and that's something even today we probably won't look too much at but it is something that needs to be thought about um again all of this i'm just i just kind of took points from that uh, existing uh, technical note that i think is a really good place to start. Uh, what we're going to see over the day is we're going to see examples of what is happening, ideas of, of we're going to talk about some of the things that are we can improve and to and some like, examples of alternative ways of looking at things, other tools that might be able to help us, whether we need to move outside this model. But this is the current model that is recommended. Um, obviously, using the epidemiological data to identify the high risk areas to say this is where we need to, using old data as well, because it, as many of us know, if, you're, if you've re responded to outbreaks uh, in the same place more than once, it frequently comes in the same places because of the background issues of underlying issues of poor access to water and, high, uh, water and sanitation, clean, safe water and sanitation. Um, oh. Well, geez, I will fix that slide before we share it. I have half a sentence. So that was areas with poor access to clean water, uh, safe water and sanitation. And I think the other thing that we probably, uh, in some contexts, underestimate is the non-physical barriers to care. So that you can have there, obviously, there's the economic that we often do provide free access uh, in terms of the treatment is free in many countries once an outbreak is declared. But there can also be, geographically sometimes think about, we don't often think about the social or cultural barriers. So again, I'm happy to say what I did wrong in the past as well. But in Haiti is one example, large outbreak in the capital Port-au-Prince. And if you looked at a map, it looked like an area that we knew where there's a lot of cases had access. But in fact, it was a different, uh, it, it was a different community. It was a different uh, 
I don't know, suburb, whatever you want to call it. So physically, it was very close, but that group of people who were at most at risk would never have gone to that health structure because it just wasn't where they went and they didn't feel like it was the right place for them to go. Now, that's a rather, Port-au-Prince can be a little bit extreme even in the, it, it, it was not like it is now, but, but even then you can have those cultural barriers if somebody doesn't speak the right language in this is, whatever the barrier is, and it's also something that we need to be looking at. Um, this afternoon, we're going to have an example from, from Sam with, with Hiram's of how we can look at what I kind of refer to as treatment deserts. You know, there's this expression of food deserts where you can't actually access, it's a UK thing about not being able to access uh, fresh food, fresh fruit and vegetables. Well, that's sort of, a, it's a healthcare access. And I do think it's something that we... Again, it sometimes it's thought about it as secondary, and it's something that we need to include in our reflections. So again, just so that we're all clear, I mean, the, the levels, home-based care is something that was probably something we'll need to look at at another time. There are a lot of discussions in countries about whether you recommendations for sugar salt solutions should be made or not. Um, many, many countries are now exclusively using oral rehydration packets. Uh, there is also the, the sugar salt solution if there's nothing else there. Um, but this idea that you start at the community level, it, we wrote the paper, I remember it, and we actually put the community level treatment first. It's the first thing you read, it's not the last. And I think even that is the sort of thing that in most guidelines you have the cholera treatment center is first, and then the community is sort of two pages at the bottom. And in this organization of care document, in fact, it's the, the community level treatment that is first. I can go through these very quickly, but this is oral rehydration for patients, zinc often for children as well. Uh, we have a session this afternoon where we will review some of the um, key questions that came out from previous reviews of the oral rehydration guidance that's being written that you, was shared with all of you previously. Whether, whether countries want zinc included, who is referred, those are, are, are decisions country level decisions, frequently all pregnant women will be referred um, in Malawi, you know, all children under five, et cetera, that's, that's a decision, but people will be referred. All patients with severe dehydration will be referred. And there also any kind of community treatment site or team is also a, a source of information for the community about how to prevent cholera, about going and seeking treatment quickly, um, and about all, you know, everything about cholera that's, that, that needs to be shared within the community. Community care is fixed or mobile, and I think it's, again, sometimes it needs to be this mix. We kind of think about one, and we probably need to be thinking more broadly. Daylight hours, seven days a week, but there, there's no hospital structure, there's no beds, there's no, it's, it's oral, and staffed either by community health workers or even by untrained staff who are just trained on these specific things for this specific outbreak. Um, there's also the notion of stabilization centers. You kind of know what, which big outbreak occurred just before we write papers sometimes. I've got five minutes. Good job. Um, because it can be, you can be in a, in a situation where you can have people who, this happened in South Africa, in fact, they built, which was, I'm just going to refer to as the stabilization center, close to the community. They could get a first IV in. They had the staff to do it. They had ambulances on site. They were transferred out to the hospital. And any patient who didn't need IV was just given ORS, and they went home. But they had that capacity. And you can adapt, and I think that's the thing, is there's always a bit of adaptation based on local capacity. That's frequently not the case, but just that that is something that was in the note and is a possibility. Oral and uh, IV treatment, so these are either called cholera treatment units. And again, this is just what we have in that paper. Uh, more skilled staff. And what's interesting is there's a notion of referring patients with complications. I think that's something that probably is not um, relevant in most situations. But I do think that in terms of some of the things we were talking about of longer care, if there is a center, again, this probably came up after Haiti, where there was a specialized center for pregnant women, um, then that, that kind of thing can happen. Um, oh, sorry, that was left. That, oh, that is one thing, in, in fact, that the idea for oral rehydration, and that note, and I've mixed it up, apologies, I wrote this quite late, is that it should be no more than one hour walk for patients. 
that was the notion that was there. For uh, CTUs and CTCs, which is the next one, then you've got 24-hour care, hospital care, and then there's the CT. There's sometimes this idea that a CTC has, because it's bigger, you may have more medical staff, so a medical doctor who can manage complications that can't be managed in a smaller structure purely for HR reasons, that you don't have enough staff to be able to do that everywhere. Um, and they're both obviously fixed sites, public and private. I do want to go back to one point on the CTU. Is this, again, in that note, what we talk about is that there is a, there's a discussion and there is a responsibility of the CTU staff vis-a-vis -vis the ORP staff, that they're actually there, they have some kind of connection and that they have some kind of discussion. How, what that looks like would be very context specific. And then I just want to say we had an excellent person doing graphics back then, um, me. Uh, so this is actually from a presentation at that time and this was the idea of how it would all work and you really do have, this. that one has a few issues, but you really do have this idea that you have multiple ORS, or as points somewhere that you're receiving ORS in the community around somewhere that can do both ORS and IV. And the more ORS you have, you're actually helping your CTC as well because you've got fewer patients coming in, they come in less severe. Again, just an example, I was in the, when I was in South Africa this year, there was a hospital that had been overwhelmed. They had good staff, they had an old, they had a COVID ward that had been built, so they, you know, it was a beautiful hospital situation. And I asked the matron, I said, well, what do you think about this stabilization center? And she lit up, her face just lit up. And she said, I'm so happy it's there. She said, we're getting fewer patients. And her word was, they are no longer on the brink. So they could actually save them ones that they who had, were severely dehydrated because they had received, they'd been that, either received ORS or they'd been stabilized. So just to say, I think everybody benefits from this, this idea of a network. And that's it.